Heidi, in terms of uh, TOC members, uh, Alexis and Zheng sent their uh, regrets due to conflicts. I have Michelle, Liz, and Brendan on the call right now. Let me know if I missed anyone that may be dialed in. Cool, might as well get started then. It's our uh, community presentation meeting. So we have Cloud Events uh, and Tuff uh, going up first with their incubation and graduation reviews, followed by Kudo and, and the Kepton projects for Sandbox. So might as well get started since it's a packed agenda today. So uh, Doug with Cloud Events first. All right, cool. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I can, loud and clear. Yes. Okay, cool. Just thought that. Okay. For those of you who may not know or miss the TOC presentation, I guess a couple months back that we did a review of Cloud Events. Um, well, Cloud Events is a specification. It's not uh, a typical open source project with code. It's a spec about how to um, modify current events to add well-defined metadata to help manage the routing and filtering or very common middleware type of, app, type of functionality uh, without requiring that middleware to actually understand the business logic. So as I said, it defines common metadata across events, a common location for that metadata to appear, so the middleware can do this basic process and not have to understand the business logic. Uh, we're delivering, obviously, the specification, serialization rules for common transports like HTTP, MQTTP, stuff like that, serialization for JSON, um, as well as a primer, some SDKs, as well as uh, extensions as well that didn't meet the criteria for actually being part of the spec itself. Uh, we have had some demos at previous KubeCons and stuff with some links there. You guys can look at that if you want. Uh, some of them are self-explanatory, some not. So if you're more interested or if, you're, if you'd like to get more information about the demos, just pin me offline. I'll tell you what's really going on. From a status perspective, um, technically we're at 0 0.3, but don't let the number fool you. Or fool you. <laughs> we're actually more at a 0.9. Um, Actually, we're hoping to approve 0.9 this week, which will technically be a release candidate 1.0, and then approve that hopefully before KubeCon and have some wonderful PR around that. Uh, for those of you who have never seen it before, on the right-hand side, you can see what a cloud event looks like. Basically, take the HTTP message with the stuff in bold, which is the cloud event stuff, and basically turn any HTTP message into a cloud event. So all we did there is add four new attributes, and that turns it into a cloud event. And that's that common bit of metadata to help people do routing for things like what type of event it is and who sent it and stuff like that. Okay, so with that quickly behind us, let's jump into why we're here. Uh, as of right now, Cloud Events is a sandbox project and we're going for incubator status. So let's go ahead and jump to the next slide. And just a quick reminder for those of you who don't know, uh, we have to meet three criteria. We have to document it's being used by at least three independent end users, healthy number of committers, as well as demonstrated an ongoing good flow of commitments and merge stuff. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So the first criteria, or I guess, so a little bit of a, a preface before we actually get to the first criteria. Um, because this is a specification, uh, it's a little bit difficult to, to come across sort of end users. It, it's, um, it's, a different, it's a different situation basically than a normal open source project. However, we did want to highlight all the different companies that are actually implementing cloud events. So you'll see the, a very distinguished list of companies here on this list. Um, and you, you basically can assume that people who are using those particular products who are going through the right code path to use cloud events are obviously using cloud events. So for example, let me pick on Knative because that's the one I'm involved in. Anybody using Knative eventing is going to be using cloud events under the covers. It's just built into that system. I don't know if I can make that same statement about all these other ones. They may have a separate code path for cloud events. but we do know that it is being used by some people of these products. The challenge you run into is a lot of people don't necessarily feel comfortable stating in public that, hey, yes, we're using this particular technology to, to, to the degree that we need for the TOC review here. But I did want to mention that we know for it, it is being used for sure, at least in these products. So users of those, of those products are very likely actually using it under the covers. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, so here are the three that we did manage to get, to get uh, convince or approval to, to mention. Um, uh, Roberto from uh, Adobe uh, has two different end users, Whitebread and Pandora. And then I came across Accenture in the public willing to admit that their product, the uh, Reactive uh, Interaction Gateway, is actually using Cloud Events under the covers as well. And you can look at their documentation to see it. 
for the Adobe stuff, uh, they're using the GDPR events, or they're passing around GDPR events as cloud events under the covers. So they are actually using it through their product. All right, let's go to the next slide. Obviously, stop me if you guys have any questions. Otherwise, I'm going to try to go fast to get the other guys in on the call. So criteria two, number of committers. Um, again, I have to sort of preface this a little. Uh, because we are a spec project, not a code project, the rate of change in our spec is much, much lower than you would see in a code open source project. And our goal here, when you submit a pull request to change the spec, isn't to try to get the one or two maintainers to approve it, right? So it's, it's not how quickly can you get your code in there. The point here is to get community consensus because this isn't about changing code in one open source project that you're hoping to be used with lots of people, but still just one code base. This is about convincing the community that this is worthy enough to be implemented by a lot of people, as many as possible. So consensus and community building is incredibly important here, right? Meeting that minimum bar of one or two maintainers, like many open source projects have, isn't going to cut it, right? We really, really need to get that consensus building here. So when you take that into account with the other factors, like um, many of the PRs that we have aren't, aren't authored by a single user. Right? Oftentimes these PRs are a collaborative in nature, either on our weekly phone calls or offline. And then one person sort of takes the pen and makes the code changes. Looking at the number of PRs submitted by any one particular person isn't necessarily a good reflection of their participation in the community. Because there are a lot of people who contribute verbally on the phone calls, comments on PRs, but they don't actually become the main author of a PR. And so it's not really fair to them to, to not include them as part of the quote, maintainers of the project. Um, and at the same time, though, if we did look at PR count, we don't want to encourage people to start playing games, right, by submitting PRs just to get their PR count up. That's not what this is all about, okay? So again, it's about consensus building. So the other thing is most of the people have other main jobs. And I know that's true of everybody for every project. But unlike many open source projects where people, we have a group of people who are basically seem like they live there 24-7 coding, because it's a specification, rate of change is lower. This is, as I said in here, it's a side gig. Okay, so again, the number of PRs are going to be much, much lower than open source projects. So I'm just giving you guys a fair warning. And we also need to make sure that those PRs are very, very carefully reviewed. Okay, we just don't want something to slip into the covers that people are surprised about. Consensus is utmost important to us. Okay, and as I said, PR count is an accurate representation of contribution. There are a lot of other things going on. However, having said all that, we do have SDKs which operate like, quote, normal open source coding projects. And you can look at those in terms of participation and those follow the normal rules of, you know, you do more PRs, you get nominated for being a maintainer and you work your way up the chain, that kind of stuff. So those are, quote, normal, okay? So let's go to the next slide. So with that in mind, um, we do not have committers in the normal sense, right? Technically, the only people that have, in essence, right access to the repo are the, maintain are the uh, admins, I think it's only two of us, all right? What, what ends up happening is issues are open. We discuss them on the weekly calls or offline through the issues themselves in GitHub. When PRs are opened, we only approve PRs during the weekly phone calls. And technically, uh, any significant changes to PRs have to be in at least two days in advance to give people a chance to actually review them. That way, no one feels like anything was slipped in at the last minute and they didn't have a chance to review it um, properly, okay? Um, the PRs themselves can technically, a veto isn't the right word here, but I couldn't think of a better phrase. Technically, anybody can sort of block a PR. And I mean that by anybody at all, not just the people who are regularly come to the phone calls. Anybody who just happens to show up on an issue can make a comment on there. And if it sounds like it's not completely <laughs> insane, right? It sounds like it's a valid concern. We want to address it. That basically puts the PR in a block state. And we have to resolve all open comments on PRs before we accept the PR in there. Now, obviously that means things could technically go a little slower and they do at times. And there's a spec, you got to get right We're about consensus, right? And, but in the end, what ends up happening is that forces people to work offline to come back with a solution that is more, uh, has broader support in it, okay? Now, obviously, not everything can necessarily be kumbaya and everybody agrees on everything. So ultimately though, ultimately though, if something does happen and we can't get to a unanimous agreement on things, um, we eventually do take a vote. So then the question is, well, if you don't have maintainers, who gets to vote? 
what we ended up coming up with is a rule that says people who show up to the weekly phone call on a regular basis get a get to have votes or get to have voting rights i should say and what that means is if you were there for the last three out of four meetings uh, but by there i mean you or your alternative from the, from your company are there for the last three or four meetings then you have voting rights now all that really means is that you care enough to actually participate in the weekly phone calls okay now you may look at that and say okay that sounds fine for people to make the phone call uh, but what are the people who can't make the phone call well then that kind of goes back to you know anybody can block the pr through a comment on the issue and you might still say well that doesn't seem quite right because they don't get to vote okay true but let's go to the next slide and if you actually look at the votes that we've been forced to take there hasn't been many right ignore the administrative votes because those are mindless things about you know do you want to go to the next level which are relatively minor if you look at the technical votes we've only really had five and if you look at all of those they've all been landslide votes right and that tells me that we're not trying to squeeze an issue through with a one vote margin of error kind of a thing right these are generally have consensus built into them and it's just one lone holdout that just couldn't manage to convince the community but everybody else basically said no this is the right way to go and i think the fact that they are overwhelming landslide votes tells us that the process we have in place to ensure that we have a community consensus is actually taking hold. And the fact that we don't have traditional maintainers isn't really a problem. And in fact, we even had people ask on the phone call of the community, do we want to change our rules? And most people's reaction, right, I should say everybody's reaction at the last time we asked to this was, let's not fix what's not, let's not change what's not broken, basically. So everybody is basically okay with it. So. I, I feel pretty good about the fact that we're a little bit different from the normal process, okay? So hopefully you'll see that we are community-based, it's not the traditional PR count type thing, but we do have something in there to make sure that everything is equitable as best we can. All right, next slide. Criteria, demonstrate ongoing flow of commits. Um, as I said, we, have, uh, uh, we do have an ongoing flow of commits. You can look at the PR count in there Honestly, I don't think the PR count matters at all because we don't actually use that for anything, especially when it comes to voting rights, but I did show it there in case you're interested. Um, the people who are crossed out are people who were active at one point, but then have kind of dropped off to go work on other things. But if you look at it, this is a good example of why the PR count doesn't really work for us. Because if you actually look at this, if you say, okay, maybe if you have five PRs or more, you get to be a maintainer or 10 or more, right? That's a good number. Well, you'd only have maybe three maintainers in the group. And that's not really fair or representative of the level of contribution from everybody in the community. However, if you look at the graph, you can see we do have a constant flow of PRs. Again, it's not a high count. This is a spec, not code. But you can see there are some, most weeks we have at least one. Some weeks we have a whole bunch, right? So there is a fair amount of activity going on in the group. So we are making fairly good progress. On average, we have around 27 people attending the phone call every week. I think that's, that's pretty good for a spec. Most people would rather get shot in the head than actually work on a spec instead of code. So 27 people on a weekly call is pretty darn good. And that's spanning 78 different organizations with four people coming from, uh, or are coming to us from non-companies, right? They're just self-affiliated. So I do think it's, it shows that we actually have a fairly good uh, rate of participation in the spec itself going forward, all right? Uh, let's go to the next slide. I think that actually might be most of it. Okay, the next two slides technically talk about the SDKs in terms of their activity. I just included this here just to show that we do have a fair amount of activity going on there. I think the orange is probably the Go SDK. That's the most popular one, probably being driven mainly by the Knative guys, because as I said, they're really using it. So as you go to the next slide, you can see, I think that's more of a PR count kind of thing. You can see what's going on there in terms of activity. Uh, but this, the SDK work isn't technically part of the review process for going to incubators. I don't think it is. Um, it's more of the spec itself, but I just wanted to show you that there is other activity going on that's code related that, that is part of the community. And I know I went kind of fast, but I think that kind of hits the main points. Um, well, I kind of looked through the questions awesome. in the chat. Are there any verbal questions people have? Hi, Doug. Yeah. Um, how, since the cloud events were sort of first muted, has anybody come up with any kind of competing specs or other kind of initiatives that you're aware of? Oh, excellent question. So the, the shorter answer is no, uh, but I will throw one thing out there that I have to make clear to people. This is not 
what I would call yet another common event format, right? Many times in the past, people have tried to create a cloud eventing structure that is, that you know, that all events are supposed to uh, adhere to, and there's one, one cloud event to rule them all kind of a thing. That's not what this is about. This is simply about taking your existing message, in most cases, um, and adding a few bits of metadata to it. And that's really all it is. And I'm not aware of any other project that tries to have what I would call a very limited, non-sexy scope to it, right? We're not trying to be that exciting. It's, it's just a common little piece of metadata to make your life a little bit easier, solve some pain points. We're not trying to solve world hunger here. And that's, so I, as a result, I don't think anybody's really thought of it or thought about doing a competing one yet. So just to clarify that, um... How would how would someone consume one of these events if the spec doesn't really tell them what's in the event? Is it, I might have missed the first couple of minutes of the talk. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so let's go back to, I guess, almost the very first slide, because that shows a sample cloud event. Oh, I did see that. Yeah, I, I, um, can, can we get someone to go back? I'm not sure who has control over the slide deck. Keep going, yeah, go all the way back to the very first non-intro slide. <laughs> Mark Peak with the SMTP analogy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, go back one more thing. Yeah, this one. Oh, right there. Yeah. So if you look at this um, in, the, in the gray box, right, that's just an HTTP message coming across, right? Now, if you look at the four HTTP headers that are in bold, those do actually tell you very, some very key bits of information. Uh, the spec version, it's the cloud event spec version itself, that's not as key that, that much. But the next one, the type, right? That tells you the type of event that this is, right? So someone receiving this message, if they are doing some sort of generic filtering and the person who specified the filter says, I want everything from bigco.com, right? They can say to their cloud event middleware, give me all cloud events whose CE type attribute is com.bigco.star, right? So this piece of middleware actually doesn't have to understand the message. All it has to do is in essence, understand regular expression matching right, to do this basic filtering or basic routing type of stuff. And that's the kind of the point here, right? We're trying to make this middleware have this ability to process these messages without understanding what's going on. And in fact, that's exactly what Knative is doing with cloud events. If you understand what's going on with Knative, they're actually inventing some basic building blocks for event routing through the infrastructure with fan out, fan in, filtering, all that other stuff. And they're basing it upon the cloud event structure. So you can do basic filtering on these fields like source, meaning where this event came from. And the middleware doesn't have to understand that this is an event from you know, some AWS service or IBM or Google service whatsoever, right? As long as they add these little bit of headers to it, the middleware should be able to get its job done. Does that answer your question, Clinton? Yes, it does, thank you. Yep, sure. All right, any other questions? Uh, no, we did not We did not register them with Ayanna. I guess technically we can consider that at some point. Um, just honestly, just hasn't come in conversation yet, to be honest. Awesome. Cool, thank, thanks, hey, Doug. Can cool. I ask one quick? Sure. Sure. Can I ask if one it's easy. question? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, ha have you guys surveyed like other things besides K Native that might be adopting the standard? Like one I know, like Argo events, um, is something that um, I, I think uh, has uh, is ad adopted cloud events. I don't know if there's any. I mean, th that should be like. Have you done like an open source kind of survey? I mean, companies might not go on the record saying they're using it, but. Uh, have you looked for other open source projects that might be adopting the the, the standard or the spec? Yeah. So for, okay. So obviously, on one of the first slides I showed uh, some places where it is being used. Um, I think Canadian might have been one of the open only open source ones there. I think everything else was proprietary. From an open source perspective, I'm pretty sure there are a couple of places out there that are being that are using it. I just don't know what they are offhand. Um, I don't think I've actually done an official okay. survey to answer your question, no. But I do know it is being picked up, at least by those proprietary members that we mentioned on slide three or something like that. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll send you, Argo Events happens to be one of them. That's a project that uh, Intuit's involved in, but um, there, yeah. there's probably other ones. Yeah, uh, that I'm might sure be a good thing to do, uh, you know, from a, 
Yeah, thank you, Mark. I'll, I'll, I'll take that link and stick it into the chart deck for the next time someone asks about this, because that's good information. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, cool. Thank you guys very much. Yeah, you can skip all the background or the backup information. Sorry about cool. that. I wasn't sure where we were going to go with the conversation. No, no worries. Thanks, <laughs> thanks Doug. I yep. think we have um, Justin next, and we'll go over uh, the sandbox proposals. Justin here? Yes. Hello. Awesome. Go for it. Steer away. All right. Um, so this is the graduation review for Tuff. And Tuff has, as I think many of you know, because you've probably you know, heard talks or discussions about Tuff over time, is the purpose of it is to let you do things like update or install software. And uh, to make this process be secure, uh, this secure this process, uh, even when an attacker goes and does things like breaks into your repository, steals a key, um, is a man in the middle on your network, and so on. It's uh, fairly easy to design a system, and we see a lot of people designing systems that work perfectly if you are perfect. Um, but uh, to actually make a system that uh, isn't sort of, you know, an attacker gets in one place and you lose massive amounts of security is actually very difficult. So tough in order to provide these sorts of properties to make a, a system so that, you know, even when attackers break into, um, you know, like a, a repository that stores your Docker uh, images or break into a place that stores um, your, your updates, your software uh, packages for a distribution or something like that, uh, in order to make all that work, Tuff uses a combination of roles, threshold signatures, selective delegation, and so on to make this happen. Uh, it's also one of these things that's surprisingly easy to go and deploy and adopt. Uh, it's it's something that you sort of drop into your system and it works and uh, people don't even know it's there. In fact, sometimes we don't know. It, in fact, I, I'll even say most of the time, we don't know when people have actually adopted it. Um, the the way that we find out is people putting up blog posts to talk about it, or um, in one case there was someone who had forgotten to uh, have their key have a long enough lifetime, so they started to get error messages saying that um, with, that had we're talking about tough in them, so that was sort of bittersweet to learn about their adoption via um, error messages from uh, them having not managed their keys correctly. But tough itself is a specification project. Uh, we have a very strong security focus, as you might imagine, uh, with a project like this. And our intention is to have a minimal design with low churn. Um, it was uh, created in 2010 to address issues um, that I found when I worked with some of the folks at, at Tor to try to do a new updater for their sort of nation state actor um, threat model that they, that they deal with on a daily basis. And we were admitted to the CNCF in 2017, along with Notary. Notary is the most widely used cloud, uh, uh, or the most widely used implementation of Tuff, at least in the cloud. Um, although there are other large companies like Datadog that use our reference implementation, our Python reference implementation of Tuff in production. And there's an automotive variant that's very, very popular called Uptain, um, where on the server side, it's basically just vanilla tough with a few very, very minor tweaks. And on the client side, it deals with the fact that cars are very difficult, challenging, weird environments. And, uh, you know, you have a bunch of devices that don't have their own connections out and don't have a notion of time and don't have a lot of other things that we sort of take for granted in, um, in cloud environments. Um, there are about a dozen different implementations of tough or the tough variant obtained by different organizations. I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of these in a moment. And uh, Tough itself uh, being a standard process, uh, first I wanna just say thanks to Doug for like really hammering home a lot of points about how specs are different than projects. That was like the, the absolute perfect um, opening act. Thank you so much, you did such a great job of covering that. Um, we have a formal process for changing the Tough standard that we're very, very conservative about and uh, really try to uh, build complete consensus within our community um, and have even for all of the changes we've made to Tough Hat actually 100% consensus um, for them after a lot of lobbying and a lot of discussion with different adopters. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so the production use of Tough, as I said, in the cloud native space, um, uh, 
that were used by a lot of large companies, as you can see there. Um, you can find uh, on our adoptions page, which the links at the bottom, you can find the um, links to blog posts and other things that talk about these. Um, I, I estimate, and I might be a little off on this, but uh, something at or over 80% of the cloud users use Notary, and at or you know somewhere around 20% use the tough reference implementation. Um, we're also used a lot in automotive through Uptain. Uh, anyone who's dealt with automotive um, knows it's a very secretive industry. It's it's very strange to me uh, because we we have people that are selling products based on it, but won't let us list their name on us like a website or say things about it like when i do you know i talk to the press about yeah you can buy it from lots of places i can't say this um and it's once again i don't really understand why that industry is so secretive but um there are quite a few implementations we can talk about and quite a few that are public um, but there are also major major tier one vendors and major oems that are using it that we're just not allowed to to name um, we're included in automotive grade Linux through the integration of a product called Actualizer, which is uh, what is a, a obtained implementation done by a, a company ATS that was bought uh, for a lot of money by a larger company called here, which is one of the major automotive uh, vendors for infotainment and uh, navigation units. Uh, and uh, based on projections that we've seen from different OEMs, we have at least one, or actually we have multiple, OEMs in the US, in um, Asia, and in Europe that have, uh, that are, that have adopted Uptane. And so um, in the next three to four-ish years, um, the projection that we've seen is, is that over a third of new cars sold in the United States will include Uptane as the way they do updates. Uh, Uptane itself was adopted under the a Joint Development Foundation uh, and the Linux Foundation. So that's where the spec uh, sort of lives now. And uh, we were also, uh, we are also an IEEE ISTO standard for Uptain. Um, and we have a lot of use like outside of um, like cloud and automotive too. Uh, Facebook is going and, and uh, um, has given a bunch of money for Python to go and integrate uh, Tough into Warehouse. Google's uh, using us in Fuchsia, we have Leap, we have a bunch of other programming languages, we have Arch Linux that's going and adopting Tough and so on. Muted yourself. Hey Justin, you muted yourself. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so, the, uh, in, in terms of committers, once again, it's a funny thing to sort of look at this, um, but if you look more broadly at the reference implementation, um, then looking at our committers, uh, we have different folks from different groups. Notary, I'm just putting it up there. They're a separate CNCF project. They're not part of this uh, graduation review for Tuff. There'll be a separate discussion about Notary at a, at a future point. Um, but uh, Notary and, and, uh, and Tuff both have um, uh, rel you know, similar numbers of committers and organizations. Optane has uh, over 100 people participate in the forum um, and has uh, something like 60 people that are uh, standards participants. And we regularly have, you know, a couple dozen people on weekly standards calls, which is, is as uh, Doug said so nicely, it's very hard to get uh, people to really care and, and dig in and look at this. Um, and we've had, you know, well over 100 people from about 50 different organizations. We have vendors, regulators, uh, folks from agencies like NISTA or um, uh, you know others like DHS and things like that that come to our Uptain meetings, like come to specific meetings just for Uptain, fly in um, in order to talk about and, and help to move the industry along. Um, and you know, uh, it's we've had a, a ton of support from OEMs. Uh, one number I, I, ha I do have approval to say publicly is in our very first meeting, 78% of cars on U.S. roads had a representative in that meeting from like their security team. And our attendance has only increased over time. So we're really uh, something that, um, uh, you know, the security folks in the automotive industry are very active on. Um, the spec itself is low churn. And so this also makes a lot of our implementations um, be quite low churn. We don't you know, our, our goal here isn't to add every bell and whistle, it's to have a solid, secure, common core that can be used. Um, next, 
Next slide. Um, all right, so looking at the flow of commits, um, a, a significant change, any significant change to TUF, like any significant addition or modification, requires a process called a TAP process. Um, this is a tough, those are tough augmentation proposals. And so um, what this process does is it basically gets all of the important stakeholders together. It's written in sort of like an RFC style um, format document. You can go on our, our site and look at these. And um, these changes add or tweak or do things that are important to basically tough as a whole and add, add uh, functionality such as uh, key rotation or uh, multi-repository support or other things like this. Um, and uh, there tend to be comments and discussions on this. Um, we've had a bunch of different, uh, 10 or so different contributors that have written um, parts of TAPS or worked on TAPS to uh, help to improve the tough spec. And we've also had a bunch of like kind of typo fixes and other things like this that are very, very, very minor that would not re represent um, something like changing code. And uh, those uh, have, I have the stats for those there. Uh, Notary and Tuff also both have a, um, you know, history of committers from uh, different groups that are integrating or doing other things with them. And so you can get some commit information there as well. Next slide. All right, and I think this is my last slide here. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention, um, we have checked all the boxes. We've adopted the CNCF code of conduct. Um, we have our governance and contributors process. You can find our adopters list for Tuff there. Um, the adopters list for Uptain is once again a little harder um, because we can't make a lot of things public, but you can find a lot of information about that on the Uptain site. Um, we have a CII best practices badge. Um, we are at silver. Uh, we are, um, two things away from gold. Uh, by the way, the you know any pro there are no projects uh, that are, have a gold star as far as I can tell that haven't cheated with XNIF options um, where they link to a site that isn't their site. So I don't think it's actually possible to legitimately or but let me just say that I, I don't think anyone is legitimately getting a gold uh, best practices badge now. Um, and I think there's some little tweaks in there that would make it hard, or that could be done to make that process a little better. But I, I feel very proud of where we're at. Uh, we're by far the highest CNCF project um, in this regard, I think. Um, and if you want to look at, at the stats about this, you can see that on there. Um, and with that, I will answer a few questions that I saw uh, fly by. I think, um, okay, so. Does, does someone want to jump in and and ask, or should I answer the separation between Uptain and Tough first? Okay, so um, Uptain uh, so uh, Uptain is a specification, but the client side is very different than Tough. Um, it does a lot of it, it. Basically, you can view it almost like a superset, but it's a superset with some with some tweaks that make more sense in automotive, um, and so. If you take the server side part of um, uh, of tough, like tough server implementations, you have about ninety percent of what you need for Uptain. Um, the things you're missing are your is in Uptain. The vehicles report back information about um, this, the the versions of the different ECUs, the different little computers in the car, and so on. Um, so Uptain is sort of a superset of of tough. Um, and uh, on the individual components in the vehicle, uh, beefy components do something that is basically tough plus a little bit of extra functionality that makes sense for cars. If they're very weak components, they do something that is like a weak subset of tough because the little microcontroller that decides when you're pulling your seatbelt, whether it should tighten or not, is a really weak little microcontroller. It's a little weak tiny computer in there and you can't do all of the more expensive things you would need to do to decide how to update that or your dome light in your car other very weak computers like that so it's a stripped down streamlined um, version of top that has weaker security guarantees and acknowledges this um, it like repeatedly and explains the differences and what you lose and so on with this um, so obtain obtain you can view it as a mostly a um, like a, a superset of tough.
Does that answer your question, Quentin, at least? Uh, yeah, partially. I'm, I'm still not totally sure. So, so if, <clears throat> if, if the tough specification changed, um, would Uptain also have to change? Or, or do they approve the changes to tough? It's not, that sort of relationship is not clear. Um, when we make changes to Tough, we work with the automotive community because a lot of the times, like it, it's it's effectively almost always the case that you want the float to be between the two. If there's something good and obtain that Tough would benefit from, you want that to come down and you want the opposite to be true. So we've had some flow between, but they're not strictly lockstep. Um, if if there are situ like you know, obtain uh, um, you know, Uptain and Tough, the people who are, like the process that you go through to approve changes to each are different. And there are different communities, but they have a lot of enough overlap. And uh, so once again, I think viewing Tough as, as mostly a subset of Uptain, um, but also being a, a part of it that's more focused and more applicable to non-automotive because there's it's 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 not that tough is like obtain minus minus it's that obtain is all the weird stuff that has to happen to make it work in a car and if we went and we did medical device version there would be all the weird stuff you have to do for medical devices but tough is the core of both of those projects and tough would be the core of you know anything else in in those regards Okay, thank you. Okay, um, thank you. If, if anyone has any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, we can move on to the next presentation. Cool, thanks, Justin. Hey folks, I'm Toby Knelp. Um, Co-presenting together with uh, Jared here. Um, so. Jared and I uh, are on the team that created Kudo. I essentially uh, you know, served as the product manager for getting it off the ground. And I'll let Jared introduce himself. Sorry, I was figuring out my mute key. Hey everyone, I'm Jared Dillon. I'm a member of technical staff here at D2IQ. And um, yeah, I um, work on Kudo day to day. All right, so let's start with uh, what is Kudo. Kudo is a toolkit for building operators. And uh, it specifically focuses on day two operations and uh, specifically for, for services that need, you know, fairly complex day two operations like distributed data services. Um, Kudo is a little bit different from, from other approaches to building operators in that it actually ships with a controller already. And so folks that build with Kudo don't have to implement their own controller. They instead just write a YAML spec that they can use to define the operations for their particular workload. And so, you know, a Kudo controller can, can that way manage multiple different types of workloads. The main abstractions in Kudo are actually as inspired by DCS Commons, uh, which is a similar sort of toolkit or SDK for building data service orchestration on top of Apache Mesos. And uh, it's been used for a couple of years to, to run these data services, you know, things like Kafka and Cassandra and others uh, in production for a couple of years. And, so uh, folks that have used these services uh, came to us and said, hey, you know, can you give us a similar experience on top of Kubernetes? And, and that's how CUDA was born. Next slide. So when we talk to folks that are building operators, um, you know, here's some challenges that we, that we found that people run into. Um, so obviously, a, you know, a controller or an operator is, is not a simple piece of software. And um, we found a lot of folks that uh, just don't have the skills on staff, on the team, uh, to write a lot of distributed systems code and go. And uh, you know, operators typically, uh, you know, at least the ones that, that are uh, production grade or are more advanced, uh, have more than 10,000 lines of code. So, and if you look at a lot of those data services, a lot of the you know, big data stuff uh, is really written in JVM languages. And so those teams simply don't have the people on staff and it, they find it challenging to hire people also. Uh, to, to write these things and go. Um, also, we found a lot of code duplication between operators. So folks that have to build uh, multiple ones, it's just a lot of code they have to write and then more importantly also maintain. Uh, so when client APIs change and, and new versions come out, they, they need to make sure that stuff still works. Um, so it's a pretty significant burden. And then another challenge we found that is that 
it's not that easy to to integrate with other CNCF ecosystem tools. Uh, and so CUDA has some uh, uh, some abstractions, some ideas for, for how to do that that we'll get to a little later. Next slide. So talking to users that want to deploy operators on their clusters, we also found a, a couple of challenges. And uh, you know, Kelsey sent this tweet a few months ago that uh, you know basically says people people really struggle with this still. Um, and and what makes it complicated for folks is that um, really different operators have different workflows and different APIs. Um, a lot of times when people deploy specifically distributed data services, they have to run multiple, right? They might use, for instance, you know, Kafka to ingest events from, um, you know, say IoT sensors or, or, or other sources, and then run you know, a Spark streaming job behind that and put some data into Elastic or Cassandra. So they run multiple of these things together. And so the, the DevOps people that manage these clusters, they have to know all these different operators, they have to know how to debug them when things go wrong. They have to know these different APIs. And so what they find themselves with is, is controller sprawl, right? They, they deploy multiple different controllers for these workloads and, uh, and have to become experts in all of them. And uh, you know, that's, that makes it complicated for folks. Next slide. So how does uh, Kudo help? Um, we'll talk about developers first, um, developers of operators. And then, and then users. So some of the main abstractions that CUDA has are around um, sequencing lifecycle operations. So lifecycle operations like you know, installing one of those services, upgrading it to a new version, rolling out new config, uh, doing a backup or a restore of a data service. And, and those are the abstractions that um, you know, the DCS Commons SDK was using for years uh, to create these, these um, lifecycle operations. So plans are the highest level concept. Uh, I'll go into a little bit of detail about the other ones uh, in, in a few slides. Um, but think about those things as, as run books. Um, you know, this all started when building Apache Mesos frameworks uh, was, was also incredibly hard. And, and we found that the people that are building these things, um, they often have more of an, an operations background and you know, weren't too familiar with distributed systems engineering. But, we found abstractions that, that feel natural to them, that they're used to using from you know, writing run books. So it's, it's a language, it's abstractions that allows them to, to sequence those operations that feels natural to DevOps people. Um, Kudo reduces the amount of code duplication and, and boilerplate between different operators. Um, you know, that's a good thing for many reasons. Obviously, uh, you know, less work, less maintenance burden, you know, less chance for bugs and, and security issues. Uh, it also reduces the number of controllers in a cluster that people have to maintain and uh, you know, control access to and, and upgrades. Um, so another thing that, that it introduces is uh, an extension mechanism. So this came up when you know, we talked to a lot of users that want to put operators into the environment, but have some specifics, um, some specific extensions or, or tweaks that they have to do to an operator. Let's say it's a you know it's very common at a bank, for example, or a pharma company um, who are regulated and have specific security requirements, or you know some other type of policy from their from their IT team that they have to follow to to deploy an operator. And so, often the only chance to do that is to to actually take an operator and fork it. Um, so you know that's that, that's not ideal. And so, what what Kudo does is um, you know this is this is under development. We have a a process to create a flavor where essentially an organization can take a base operator that's available uh, in the open source and they can customize it to meet their regulatory requirements or, or other types of policies that they have. Very common issue that we ran into. Uh, and then essentially it's, you know, it's, a, it's a tool that gives ISV software vendors um, a way to ship the best practices for the day two operations alongside their software. Uh, oftentimes they already have backup tools, restore tools, and other, other tools like that. Um, so CUDA provides an easy way to, to wrap those and, and, and that way make it easy for people to follow best practices. Next slide. So how does CUDA help the end users? So the folks that just want to run these operators? Um, it ships with a plugin for kubectl, kubectl CUDA. Um, that's sort of your main interface to deploy and upgrade and manage Kudo-based workloads. Um, 
and it provides a standard interface. So, you know, if I want to run Kafka and Cassandra and Elastic together, I use the same command line tool. It provides a similar interface. And, and that really helps um, with this issue that I mentioned earlier, where folks have to, you know, use different APIs or different debugging tools um, with operators that are not built on the same foundation. So the example you see on this slide on the right here is Kudo plan status, which uh, prints how, you know, how much progress Kudo made um, deploying a particular plan. So I can easily follow along, say, you know, which steps are completed here, which phases are completed, where is it stuck? And then, you know, I can dig in further and, and investigate if, if something went wrong. Um, so really simplifies um, deploying multiple operators in a cluster that way, because I only have to run one controller for that actually. Um, and, you know, use kubectl kudo to deploy these uh, these packages, these YAML manifests to allow this one controller to manage multiple different types of workloads. So in a nutshell, simplified API and CLI experience. Next slide. So here's an example of what um, defining an operator with Kudo actually looks like. It's you know, a part of the what, what you would build, but it's sort of the main part. Uh, this is what a plan looks like. So in this case, we're defining a deployment plan for, for this workload. That's the, the top level item here. A plan breaks down into phases. Uh, so phases are essentially a grouping mechanism for different tasks that need to be executed. And um, phases get executed using a strategy. So there's a serial or a parallel strategy because uh, different workloads need either serial or parallel. Um, you know, there's also the option to plug in custom strategies. Um, it's under, under development. Within each phase, you have steps, and steps again have a strategy, parallel or serial. And while these are pretty simple abstractions, right? Plans and phases, the steps, and, and a strategy to go along with them, um, we've orchestrated some pretty complex workloads with that. So um, HDFS, for instance, has a pretty complicated life cycle. Um, some things get deployed in parallel, some things get deployed in serial. Um, but you know these pretty simple abstractions allowed us to actually do this, and and so um, we we found it to be both both simple and really powerful even for for advanced uh, workloads. Within each step, you have tasks, uh, and then tasks are you know very simply are templated Kubernetes manifests. Um, so alongside with the Kudo definition, you ship uh, a number of these uh, of these templates, and Kudo fills in variables um, that you define as part of Kudo at install time or with defaults um, defined by the package author. Um, and yeah, so going really fast here, but those are the, the high level abstractions in Kudo. Next slide, I'll hand it over to Jared. Perfect, so, um, so, so we're, what we're trying to do a little bit is thread the needle with Kudo. So just to give some comparisons of, of different things we're trying to do. Um, first, I'll, comp uh, I'll compare to operator SDK and Cube Builder. Um, and so, really, Kudo is built on top of Cube Builder initially. We've we've dropped down more to controller runtime, but we're looking at ourselves as a polymorphic controller. Uh, and and what we want to do is have a single or, or a subset of controllers that can run multiple types of operators. And we want to contribute uh, the configure those with various CRDs and make it extensible down down the road um, to support more use cases. Um, and this goes back to a really important thing that I think I think was brought up early on and that is you know to why kudo is that a lot of the stateful services already have a large SDK around them they have CLIs already built around them they have teams working on these and and so we're orienting kudo around existing clients and tooling rather than rebuilding all of the ops functionality in, in go using go API's um, we, we love QBuilder, QBuilder is great, controller SDK is great, operator, operator SDK is great, and we want to be compatible with those things. But we want to be a little more opinionated and take the 60% of the way if you follow those opinions and take it to 80, 90% if you follow those opinions. Um, and we want to allow people to build operators using a set of Kubernetes primitives. Uh, we have our own built-in testing harness rather than having to do a bunch of software development with these SDKs uh, for, for a certain use case. Like, Again, we're not trying to replace these these toolings. Um, we're trying to be the right choice for the right situation. If you were to look at, um, you know, a high level framework for operators, that that's what that's what Kudo's intended to be. Uh, next slide. 
So that naturally brings up a comparison to Meta Controller. And for those who aren't aware, uh, Meta Controller is, is very much in the same space. It's a polymorphic controller uh, for multiple types of applications uh, that can effectively call out to webhooks to, to define various uh, manifests and, and runs those in a set of orders. So uh, Meta Controller ships with a custom set of Sorry, I just pulled the wrong cable. Um, Meta controller ships a certain set of controllers. Uh, we avoid that and we just try to use Kubernetes primitives directly. Um, and Kudo is intended to also be an operator for CRDs. So, so Kudo will do reference counting on those CRDs. It'll, it'll make sure those are registered. Whereas if you were to look at the old Vitess operator for Meta controller, you'd have to run the etcd operator independently. And so Kudo supports this idea of depending on sets of uh, uh, CRDs that come from necessarily elsewhere. Um, and that gets into the next point, like Kudo, we, we, what we're wanting to do is support dependencies so that you can build a lot of modular operators. So, so for example, one of our reference implementations is Kudo, which depends, I'm sorry, Kafka, which depends on, on Zook. Looking at more modularity between our, our various operators. Um, and then, then Kudo is all about sequencing of complicated applications, uh, something that, that you know, Meta Controller and other frameworks don't necessarily look at, but can be important with really complicated services. Uh, one of those that we've, we've dealt with at uh, D2IQ and uh, on Mesos in the past has been HDFS, um, which requires some level of sequencing that can't just be solved by throwing a bunch of uh, manifests at the API server all at once. Um, and, and Meta Controller, like, also, we're looking really at the what happens after I've deployed. So having plans for backup, restore, um, adding a Kafka topic, stuff like that is very important to Kudo. You know, what happens once I, once I actually deploy? Um, we look at application awareness in upgrades, in scale up and scale down. Uh, if you were to look at, for example, etcd, etcd requires an API action to be able to add a member and remove a member. Uh, and so we want to enable developers to add build in that application awareness in a high level way to their applications. Next slide, please. So looking at Helm, uh, we love Helm. We're actually about to support Helm as a uh, manifest format. Um, and really the differences we're looking at with Helm and, and us is, is more that you know, we're, we're a framework for operators, whereas Helm is a framework for and templating system for applications. Um, so we're looking at what happens post deploy, and and so we're looking at drift detection, repair, alerting, and monitoring, which we're working on, and again those sequencing steps. Um, we're also looking for higher level features of supportability, um, as well as as doing some work around sandboxing of instances and sol solving that root tiller problem, um, which is a hard problem to solve. I know you know Helm three does not have tiller, um, so we, we're working on on ways to to solve that. Um, so, so coming in the next version of Helm is this idea of being able to rely on Helm charts as a base and then progressively enhance Helm charts into an operator where you can start to add other plans around upgrading, around uh, backup, restore, other things you might want to do, but use a, a, a well-tested Helm chart as your base for that. Next slide, please. So look at the Kudo ecosystem. Like I said, we built on built, we build on top of QBuilder and controller runtime. We're well involved with the uh, API machinery SIG inside of Kubernetes and, and chat with them a lot. Um, like I said before, we're wanting to extend upon existing Helm charts. We're also looking at CDAP bundles. Um, we're not trying to solve, other than getting an initial idea of, of how to do the sequencing, the application definition problem. Um, we want to provide the, I have an application, what do I do now? Uh, solution there and, and, and solve that problem. Um, and I think that's all I have to say on that slide. So next slide. So our roadmap, we're looking at becoming a better at registering and managing CRDs so that you get an operator-like experience of custom CRD plus controller. Uh, we were relying on some, some bug fixes that landed in Kubernetes 115 to do that. And so that development arc has begun. Um, we're looking at incorporating other things to the community like application CRD. Uh, dependencies are in progress so that you can, you can have a web of dependencies between operators and, and build up larger abstractions based on individual operators. 
Um, as Toby mentioned, we're working on extensions right now. Um, package distribution is now in, and that actually that that point has been fixed as of our last release. Um, and then we plan on testing these in a large mixed workload way out in the open, so that if you were to install a Kafka operator, uh, we have vetted that across uh, you know to a certain scale for a certain number of Kafka operators. And so so when we say an operator is is stable. What we mean is, is Kafka running on Zookeeper and all those components are stable working together as a dependent set of tooling. Uh, next slide. So why the CNCF? Um, we, we've built this project out from the beginning, hoping to drive a larger day two awareness inside the CNCF. Um, we want to grow that, that sentiment and, and continue that work. Um, so we, we followed, open contribution from the beginning. We, we followed everything required. I, I, you know, it was a large topic in the last TOC meeting about, uh, about the certain things you need to do. We've tried to do that from the beginning to be a neutral home and try to promote the mission of this rather than um, the certain project. Um, and, and what we really wanted to do is have people building more operators, build more stateful services on top of Kubernetes and provide a platform in which to do so. So, um, you know, all, all we've set so forth here is a vision for that and, and hopefully we can bring in more and more people to help um, really sharpen that knife and, and bring a really great day two and stable service experience to Kubernetes. Um, and, and again, like it's really about growing the community around this project and around what we're trying to do for, you know, I have deployed my application, I've deployed my stable service, now what do I do? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and I guess that's it for us. So um, thank you very much. I'm Jared Dillon and uh, presenting with me was Toby Knopp. And, uh, and we're happy to take your questions. I don't know what time we have. We're, we're yeah. over time, so I'll turn it back over. Sorry. Uh, I'll take questions in the CNCF Slack, I guess, and Kubernetes Slack. Cool, thanks. That pretty much puts us over time. So we'll uh, uh, reschedule the Kepton uh, presentation to the app delivery SIG and um, we'll see each other uh, next time. So thanks everyone and thanks everyone who presented.